All right, I'm back. Let's keep going with this book. I'm going to do another video here. So let's take a look at the last video that I did. So we learned about the six levels of, of preparation or of implementation of, of machine learning in a uh, environment. Um, so let me go back and review that quick and then uh, keep reading. Um, oops. Looks like it's very difficult to move back. Uh, it keeps accidentally opening this menu. Uh, let's see if there's an easier way. Okay, this is easier now. I can see the arrows. Alright. Oh, not quite. There we go. So, th these are the six levels of machine learning maturity in your organization hopefully you're at level six but if you're not at any of these levels a good level to start at is level one which is framing scope identification and problem identification once you've got that down and, and there is a need to implement machine learning uh, there might not always be so uh, it's it's important to uh, have a problem to work for because otherwise you'll be sinking a lot of time and, and money into a solution without a problem then level two is the continuous delivery of the data level three continuous delivery of the clean data level four continuous delivery of EDA which uh, I still don't know what that means even though I read that whole part presumably and level five continuous delivery of traditional ML and auto ML and then level six is ML operational feedback loop. So let's take a look at level four quick again because I don't know what EDA is. Exploratory data analysis. Okay, well now I know what it is. It's exploratory data analysis. So let's continue on. I'll click on the bookmark here. There we go, and that's where I already, already was. So the next part is SK Learn Flask with Kubernetes and Docker. Let's walk through a real world deployment of a SK Learn based machine learning model using Docker and Kubernetes. Here is a Docker file. Note that this serves out a Flask application. The Flask application will host the SK Learn application. Note that you might want to install Hadoo Lint, which will which allows you to lint a Docker file. So let's do that. Um, I'm going to do the example. I, it's important to me to get these examples working because this is this is kind of something that matters to me, machine learning. So so we're at. Uh, I think we're still at chapter 14. Uh, this might be chapter 15. Um, no, we're still at chapter 14. So let's do, uh, let's make a new, um, let's let's open up a, a Jupyter Notebook. So first we're gonna uh, open the uh, virtual environment. So source BNV bin activate, and then pip install. Do update uh, upgrade pip. And then pip install Hadoo Lint. Alright, that's not working now. Um, I guess oh um so there's an issue with uh, it looks like my internet's fine, but this could be something where my internet connection isn't working. I used to have to deal with an internet outage every single day, and there was a uh, they would show up in my videos too. But I recently, I don't think I talked about this on stream, but I um, I was able to I was able to switch my internet service provider and now I get 600 down but I also get 600 up so 
for me to upload videos now, it used to be a few hours. Now it's a few seconds, if that. Under a second, I can upload this video. And um, so my bill must be, you know, a lot more. Well, guess what? My bill is less. It's $15 less a month. And I get symmetrical speeds. And I get, um, I used to at most get 12 for for uploaded. Now I get 600. So that's um that's very good all right so there we go now it's time to uh download the extra thing so pip oh so there's nothing for how to lint um so i guess i'll search for it so i do want to See if I can get that on there. It might be on the next page. All right, let's see if there's instructions on the next page. So yeah, so here's the repo, which is where I already was, but I'll open it again. Okay, so we can run it locally. So that means that we get it through uh, apt. Yeah, so sudo apt get install. Yeah, it's a it's a bash application, so gets uh, installed through a bash. Um, package manager instead of a Python package manager. Oh, and it looks like I, I couldn't find it. Let me try doing an update and try it again. Looks like the sun's coming up. That's good. waiting for headers seven seventeen the sun should be rising um, all right Oh, so here's here's instructions to install. So we can use a scoop. I've never heard of that. Um, or Mac. I'm not using either. I'm using Linux. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't have instructions for that. That's unusual. Um, but anyways, uh, let's just move on and, and forget about that. It's just not necessary. So I'm going to make a uh, Docker file now. And you know what I'm going to do is make a all new um, all new folder for this. MKDIR Python we're going to say uh, Python for DevOps and then we're going to call it uh, uh, esc SK learn example. All right, and then move into that. Okay, and now I'm going to deactivate this virtual environment and make a new one. All right, so now my if my requirements are different, then they'll be contained. And I'll do a pip install upgrade pip.
All right, and now uh, I'm going to make a Docker file. So we'll do code Docker file. And there's a Docker extension. I guess I will install it just because. Okay, so the next part is building out the file. So we'll start by copying this and pasting it in. Okay, and it looks like it didn't put everything in the right lines, so I need to just fix that here. All right, now on to the next one. Okay, so now I can save it. And it's, it's asking me again. Um, oh, it looks like it's still installing it. That's OK. So this is the make file, and it serves as a central point of the application runtime. OK, so next I need to make a make file. So code make file. And uh, looks like there are some uh, make file tools as well. So I'll install that one. Okay, so this is the make file, so now this is this is a different kind of file, it's a make file, so the lines might be a little bit different. But so far it looks pretty straightforward. White spacing might be different. All right, and the next page, got some more here. So we can see the, the structure of a project here. This is really good because this shows all the files necessary. This gets very confusing for, for beginners to, to know that all these files are needed, especially since they're not always needed. You know, it's just kind of a way of making it's like an optimization and I feel like uh, optimizations kind of uh, trip up a lot of people because they just focus so much on the optimization they don't know what they're doing and the optimization is, is for something else that they don't need. All right, so there's the make file. We need one more file. Um, so far we've got a make file, virtual environment folder, and a docker file. So now we need a requirements.txt file.
All right, and then the next one is an app uh, dot py file. All right, and this is just done with my local hardware. I think it's important to note here that this depends on having a pretty sophisticated local hardware. So this isn't like a cloud project where just anyone can can do it as long as they're willing to pay the costs of, of the, the cloud. This is a, a project that depends on the hardware of your computer. All right, so there we go. Really, really glad I don't have to. Okay. I do have to clean up the lines, which is not fun, but it's not so bad. Okay, and now there's the scaler. So next is the app. Name, there we go. Log. And then uh, set level. Definition. Scales payload. Okay, this on another line there, like that. And they, they do it that way. Oh, in this case, it's a... Oh, you know what? It's just uh, from pasting it over. It's not a syntax choice. Now the return statements. And there we go. And then this app route, it looks like it belongs on its own. It's not a part of the definition there. The, the function definition. All right, so next part here. So this is another definition here with the decorator like that. Decorators are kind of sophisticated. I forget exactly how decorators work. Okay, now this is all just a um, a comment here, but it's a prediction. Uh, and then input looks like uh, okay, this is on the next one. All right, that looks good. So this is just knowledge of, of Python that I have that allows me to uh, clean this up, make this look a little nicer. I do like the space after that, so I'm going to keep that. I'll be consistent by keeping it here as well. But I don't like the leading space. Um, 
Actually, I think I am going to take it out there. Okay, and then here we go. All right. All right, and then the next part is result looks like. Okay, so we need a closing like that. Perfect. And then result looks like. <sighs> All right, looks good to me. So now it's uh, this line I can just type out. Okay, and then that gets uh, indented. Oh, you know what? All of these are indented one higher, so this one goes outside of the definition. And we can see that's especially clear because there's a return statement. Return statements are uh, the end of a uh, function definition. Sometimes they don't have to be at the end, depending if there's like conditionals, but uh, typically they are. All right. Okay, so it looks like we need a lot more files. Um, so the next file will be the run underscore docker dot sh file. And uh, it looks like I don't even have the Python extension installed, so I'll install that. And now let's do this next file. And the sun is coming up. I might want to take a quick pause and go out and meet the sun just because it's a cloudy day though, but uh. all right, so this is so the interpreter can know what program this is, is as an executable. When it's defined as an executable in, in Linux, it'll know which program to use for the executable. It'll use bash. Okay, and then this goes on another line. Docker run. There we go. So uh, <laughs> lots more files. We've got files for days here. So the next one is run. Kubernetes.sh. Uh, 
car. I'm sure there's more to this. Yep, a lot more. Generator image, so the syntax is, has to be fixed. Port and uh, labels is on the same line, should be fine. All right, and lots more to the file still. All right, we've got a lot of police sirens at the window. Um, early in the morning, good way to start the day. Um, let's just continue going here. So push image. All right, so yep, this file is good. SK learn Flask with Kubernetes and Docker. You may be asking yourself how the model got created and then picked out. You can see the whole notebook here. Okay, so so I'm th there's even more files that need to be added, um, and you know what? I'll advance my bookmark. Delete the old one. It's still a lot of police sirens, more than there were before. Uh, well, I guess I won't go out and see the sun then. This sounds pretty distant still. Um, so let's see here. So SK learn Flask with Kubernetes and Docker. There we go. So let's see the whole notebook file. Oh, okay, good. It takes me to another, it takes me to a repo. Good. I like that. Oh man. But you know what? I, I can run this now because I have one of the, it should be calling a Docker container, right? All right, and there's still a lot of police sirens. Um, not sure what's going on. It's 7.19 in the morning, so good time to commit crimes, I guess. Um, All right, so first import some libraries for machine learning, and, and we saw that in, in there. So now this is gonna be a, a uh, Jupyter Notebook. So let's uh, start uh, the Jupyter Notebook server from here. So we're gonna say Jupyter Notebook. Oh, um, and I, I don't have that installed, so easy solution for that. Okay, 
so uh, now I should be able to to start the notebook server. Oops. Um, hmm. Alright, so a lot to install there. I just kind of blindly did that second command. I'm not sure if that was needed. The good news is it, the downloading doesn't take long at all. It's just the installing that takes long now. Because I got my internet upgraded. All right, moving along here a lot faster. Perfect. There, and now we've got everything we need. NumPy, all everything here is now uh, installed and ready for use. So let's do Jupyter Dash uh, Notebook now. There we go. So uh, we've got that open, and we've got a new browser. So now we can uh, enter in the the token that we've got from here. Um, there we go. So now we've got it uh, with the token fed to it. And we can see all the files in here. So now uh, let's create a uh, another file. And it's going to say uh, uh, sklearn uh, notebook. Let's call it that. So I can go new uh, notebook here. I'm going to call it SK Learn Notebook. There we go. I'll rename that. And now we can start entering in cells. And it's easier to copy and paste uh, from uh, from another location. So let's copy and paste from uh, here and uh and and then check back in with the book later so it should be easier to copy and paste from here so the first one and we can see that with this input equals zero um there we go so we're just loading modules with this first one so let's see how this works and there's the mean squared error so that should be um, oh, so we're missing uh, Seaborn.
All right, should be a lot better now. So now it's time for uh, running it again. Uh, still didn't find Seaborn, so I think I think it needs to be reloaded or or something to. Uh, yeah, so I think the notebook has to be restarted. There we go. I guess we could have just restarted the kernel. That might have, have helped it, but... Okay. Oh, sorry. So Seaborn, there's still no, uh, so let's try restarting the kernel and clearing all outputs and then let's try running it all. Okay. So there's still no, uh, module named, uh, Seaborn. Um, I'm going to put Seaborn in here, just see if that helps things. All right, and now let's try it again. We'll open the Jupyter Notebook again. I'll try to run this now. Okay, and even though... Uh, I do have a Seaborn. We verified that uh, multiple times. Something is happening so that it cannot find uh, uh, the module, even though the module is installed. So I'll try um, uh, restarting and clearing all the outputs. And then I'll try running all the cells. Okay, so didn't find it again. So I'm going to try reconnecting to the kernel. Um, now try shutting down the kernel. All right, and then I'll I'll try to bring the kernel uh, back up by doing uh, by clicking this here. Then I'll click what run. Uh, restart and run all. All right, and we've got the same problem here. There's no module found named uh, Seaborn. So what happens if I stop and then I do a Python, IPython3, um, and then I do an import Seaborn. Okay, so if I do that, we see that it does have Seaborn. So I'll try running the notebook again. All right, and then I'll uh, restart and clear all output. And then I will uh, run all the cells and we can see I don't have Seaborn. So there's some sort of discrepancy between the uh, notebook and then what the notebook can see and the um, the uh, d just uh, what is seen in here so hmm Alright, so it can't find a module, 
Um, hmm. That's weird. Why can't it find the module? All right, well, let me do this. <laughs> what the heck? It says it's already installed. Um, okay, um, I think I remember something so if, well, let's go deactivate and then let's go back uh one and then go to the other one for chapter four um and then uh let's uh do a source vin b activate and then a pip freeze okay so i think yeah seaborn is installed in this one so let's try let's try um doing it with with this virtual environment activated instead All right, and the police are back out. More sirens. Uh, so let me try this again. Hey, you know what? It worked now. So, yeah, there was some issue with my Seaborn. This might have been the one where they say don't install it as Seaborn. I remember there was something like that, but... Having the other uh, VNV open uh, seems to be working for now, so let's continue on. All right, so the next step is here. Oh, so we've got a problem here. Um, we've got a. Uh, oh, you know what? It's it's just it's just that it's just a warning. So that should be fine. Moving on to the next. And there we go. We get the same uh, uh, chart that they did. Um, same values. Same everything. So yeah, things are working. Now this is the EDA, if we remember what that means. It's the um, data something. <laughs> I forget what it means. Exploratory data analysis. And I wish I knew how to make that happen. Oops, uh, something happened there. Oh, we got a problem here now. There's a key error. It's one of these. It's not working. Oh, you know what? I it looks like I already did it. So this this second one is is extra here. Let me uh uh get rid of that cell. All right. And then from here add a new cell. All right, and then the next part is modeling. So we're going to split the data. Okay. 
Okay, that went good. And now hopefully we'll get the same output here. There we go. Now I've got the tune scaled G GBM. I don't know what that means. Oh, so we've got a problem here. Value error. All right, well, let's set uh, shuffle to true. Why not? Oh, you know what? It's it's meant to be like that. Oh, no. Oh, I see. So, so it says here that the default IID parameter um, will change from true to false. So here it's it's set to true, but here it was changed. So now it's set to false by default. So we do need to change this to true to match what was here. So this is on line, so shuffle equals uh, true. We're going to need to add so random under random underscore state okay so this is this is happening um, in uh, line eight, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So yeah, here it is, model. So now we can add, um, oh no, here it is, here it is. Yeah, so now, now here we can add um, shuffle equals true. There we go, and now we don't have that error anymore. Um, but also, we don't have the the output here. Oh, now we got it. It just took a while for it to come up. Okay, so yeah, everything's a little bit different. I think it depends on the the hardware, like it's doing the actual calculations. So. Um, yeah, things are a bit different, but uh, more or less, it looks the same. So the next is is to fit the model. We're gonna get a mean squared error, which is fun. There we go, mean squared error. Hey, mine's mine looks uh, more accurate than theirs. And then evaluate, because I know exactly what all of this is doing and what it means. So looks the same to me yep looks exactly the same oh, oh, oh. sorry I'm just as I'm doing this I'm thinking like because I follow some like real estate analysis stuff or like it's like wow there's 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 a lot of potential behind this <laughs> if you really understand what you're doing all right so next is ad hoc of predict Oops. All right, looks good to me. Then the next part. Looks good. And now we've got a uh, JSON workflow, which is useful for debugging Flask apps, which is what this is. And scale the input. Looks good. List uh, next. We're going to convert it to this to a list. So we got one value. It's the same. It's more or less the same. I've got an extra digit. Uh, all right. So next part is pickling uh, SK learn model. So we need a new 
cell here. Oops, so we're missing a, um, yeah, so we can't import a uh, job lib from, uh, from this. Hmm. Well, let's try maybe just like that. Nope. Huh. Well, that's no good. Um, you know what? I'm I am interested in what ChatGPT has to say about that. It looks like you encountered an import error while trying to import Joblib from sklearn. Externals. In recent versions of scikit-learn, the Joblib module has been deprecated from sklearn. Externals. You should import Joblib directly instead. Here's how you can do it. If you haven't installed Joblib as a separate package, you may need to do so using pip. If you have any more issues or questions about Python code, feel free to ask. All right, that works. So it's just no longer they they redesigned how the package is. These uh tutorials can go out of date very fast. Well, look at that. So we've got the housing uh, predict housing uh, prediction. So now we need to unpickle it and we're going to predict. So it's unpickled. And we're predicting there's the predictions. All right. Scale input. So we got the array. Now we're going to use uh, pickle loaded model. And there we go. So everything went through. Um, this is just going through step by step. There might be some comments or something. Yeah, so here's a comment. There are the features of the model. So these are the features of the model. So the CHAS, which is the Charles river dummy variable. I don't know what that is. I don't know who Charles River is. Um, one if tracked bounds river, zero otherwise. The RM is the average number of rooms per dwelling. The tax is the full property value, property uh, tax rate per $10,000. Then the PT ratio is the pupil teacher ratio by town. BK is the proportion of black people by town. L stat is a uh, lower status of population. Uh, med V is the median value of owner occupied homes in 10,000 uh, thousands or in thousands, not 10,000. So there we go. Okay, modeling. This is where the modeling occurs in the notebook. One useful strategy to always create is is to always create four main sections of a notebook in dash ingestion uh then eda which is uh something data something exploratory data analysis modeling and conclusion in this modeling section, the data is extracted from the data frame and passed into the sklearn train underscore test underscore split model, which does the heavy lifting of splitting the data into training and validation data. All right, so that's, that's the same as was in the notebook before. 
tune scaled GBM. I'm not sure what GBM is. Let's take a look. So gradient boosting uh, machines. This um, model uses several advanced techniques that you can reference in many successful Kaggle projects. These techniques include grid search, which can help find the optimal parameters. Note too that scaling of the data is performed. Most machine learning algorithms expect some type of scaling to create accurate predictions. So there we go, I've already got that in there. Uh, as far as I, uh, yeah. I remember this K fold. Yep, looks good. Okay, so fit model. This is uh, this model is fit using the gradient boosting regressor. The final step after training the model is to fit the model and check for error using the data that was set aside. This data is scaled and passed into the model, and the accuracy is valued using the metric mean squared error. All right, so mean squared error. Let's see what I got for that, uh, just to make sure I'm on the right page still. Uh, I don't remember where that was. Oh, here it is, I think. Yep, so mean squared error is about 26. Yep. All right, evaluate. One of the trickier aspects to machine learning is evaluating the model. This example shows how you can add predictions and the original home price to the same data frame. That data frame can be used to subtract the differences. Now this is different from the word subtract. This is the word subtract. I, I have never heard of that word before. I'm, I'm wondering if that's a actual different word or if it's meant to be sub uh, subtract. Um, so is And this is important because we're dealing with a lot of new words here. Subtract is actually a common misspelling of word subtract. The correct word to use when referring to the mathematical process of taking one quantity away from another is subtract. Okay, so what what about what about in the context of data science and machine learning? Is it a valid word in that context, or is it definitely just a typo? Okay, yeah. All right, well, yeah, it kind of makes sense. So the data frame can be used to subtract the difference. So we can see it right here, evaluate minus. The differences are shown here. Using the describe method on pandas is a great way to see the distribution of the data. All right, and then ad hoc underscore predict. Let's test this prediction model to see what the workflow would be after unpickling. When developing a web API for a machine learning model, it can be helpful to test out the sections of code that the API will perform in the notebook itself. It is much easier to debug and create functions inside the actual notebook than struggle to create the correct functions inside a web application. JSON workflow. This is a section of the notebook that is useful for debugging Flask apps. As mentioned earlier, it is much more straightforward to develop the API 
code inside the machine learning project, make sure it works, then transport the code to a script. The alternative is trying to get the exact code syntax in a software project that doesn't have the same interactive tools that Jupyter provides. Scale input. The data has to be scaled back to be predicted. This workflow needed to be flushed out in the notebook instead of struggling to get it to work in a web application that will be much tougher to debug. The section below shows the code that solves that portion of the machine learning prediction pipeline. It can then be used to create a function in a Flask application. Pickling sklearn. Next, let's export this model. Unpickle and predict. Ad hoc predict from pickle. Scale input. Finally, the pickled model is loaded back in and tested against a real data set. So here's some exercises. What are the key differences between sk-learn and PyTorch? What is AutoML and why would you use it? Change the sklearn model to use height to predict weight. Um, run the PyTorch example in Google Collab notebooks and toggle between CPU and GPU runtimes. Explain the performance difference if there is one. What is EDA? Um, so it's something data analysis, I think. Exploratory data analysis. And why is it so important? I don't know why it's important. Oh, because it, it can help clean the data up. All right, so case study question. Go uh, to the Kaggle website, take a popular notebook in Python and convert it to a containerized Flask application that serves out predictions using the example shown in this chapter as a guide. Now to deploy this to a cloud environment via a hosted Kubernetes service such as Amazon EKS. Um, that's going to cost me some money in cloud, so uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, let's read the learning assessments. Explain the difference between types of machine learning frameworks and ecosystems. Um, so I guess a big difference would be cloud or not cloud, whether you own the GPUs or not. Run and debug a pre-existing machine learning model in uh, side-learn and PyTorch. Containerize a Flask side-learn model. Understand the production machine learning maturity model. So I'm, I'm not going to go really into depth uh, of those. Unfortunately, it's, it's just a lot and, and there's kind of nothing driving me to I'm not going to take a test or anything like that so um, hey look at this 81% of the of the way there so um, yeah that's it for this video uh, and stay tuned for chapter 15